As always, we begin with a, an acknowledgement of the country. So we meet here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and the lands we never seen. Um, today, we are incredibly privileged to have Daniel Bennett, don't give me that look down, uh, <laughs> um, talking to us about my favorite topic, cool models of hot cognition, also titled modeling the, the interactions between subjective emotion and risky decision-making. Um, I'll just quickly say that uh, when I came to this university in 2019, I was repeatedly told how unfortunate I was that uh, this amazing man, Daniel Bennett, uh, <laughs> I'm getting had, had left for Princeton uh, the, the year before. Um, and it was incredibly uh, awesome that at Math Psych, I got to meet Dan for the first time, and I gotta say, he lives up to the hype. So, without further further ado, and speaking him up immensely. That's yeah, that's the, the kindest introduction I've had. Thanks, thank you so much. <laughs> Over there. Um, thank you very much for having me to talk in this in this series, everyone. I am um, uh, I I'm really happy to talk in a series where I feel comfortable enough to to put a dumb title like this on the on the talk. I um I remember there was a talk in this series. Uh, maybe it was towards the end of last year that was, I think it was called like the last diffusion model talk you'll ever need was or something like that. Yeah, and I'm like, well, if somebody can say something as transparently wrong as that, I'm allowed to call my models cool with my, in my, in my title. Um, uh, I, th I think that was Nathan, wasn't it? I hope yeah, no, no, no disrespect to Nathan. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some attempts to use the, the techniques, the tools of computational cognitive science um, to answer some questions that I think haven't traditionally fallen within the purview of computational cognitive science. And that's, um, the, the title is modeling the interactions between subjective emotion and risky decision-making, but actually it's this, this idea of hot cognition that I wanna start with. Um, this comes from, a, it's a distinction that wasn't originally drawn by uh, cognitive scientists. It was actually originally, I think a little bit of a diss of cognitive psychology. So it comes from like early uh, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s social psychology um, that distinguish between uh, hot cognition on the one hand and cold cognition on the other. And in this dichotomy, what uh, cold cognition was is everything that cognitive psychologists were studying in the laboratory, all the very good work on you know, memory and decision-making and learning and, and so on. Um, and the social psychologists were saying, well, actually a lot of real world cognition is, is hot. It's colored by feeling. So we may know very well what, um, what the properties of working memory are uh, for lists studied in the laboratory, but, but um, that may not necessarily tell us that much about the way memory is deployed in the real world. Um, according to this claim. Um, so uh, cold-blooded here is, is a diss. I think, I think it can also be a, a badge of honor. Um, of course, like the, this idea of like, you know, there, there is, you know, cold cognition, the kind of uh, pure mathematical in some way, you know, operations of an information processing architecture versus hot cognition. That, that same basic idea crops up in a bunch of different places. Um, it's not unique to social psychology, dissing cognitive psychology. Um, you know, so if you go back to uh, Keynes in, in economics, you have this idea of animal spirits. So, you know, we, we want to uh, uh, explain things with expected utility theory or some variant of it, but people will do all these strange things that we don't expect. And the, the reasons they do these are these animal spirits. Um, uh, in, in David Hume's moral philosophy, you have reason versus passion, and it crops up in a bunch of other places as well. Um, so whether or not you accept this distinction, and I, you know, I, I, I don't make any stipulation either way, um, I think it's fair to say that if we... If we agree that there is some sort of distinction to be drawn between uh, cognitive processes imbued with emotion, with feeling, and cognitive processes that are less imbued with emotional feeling, that a lot of the things that we might want to study because they're consequential uh, outside the laboratory in the real world uh, uh, would fall under the heading of hot rather than cold cognition. Um, and just one example here, which is another thing that I uh, am trying to study, but that I won't talk about today, is uh, gambling behaviors. That would be a classic example of hot cognition because the, the decision to go on gambling at an electronic gaming machine, for instance, is probably not based on a, a cold appraise for probabilities and payoffs. There seem to be some other sort of things going on there as well. Um, so if we do accept this hot-cold dichotomy, then the argument would go that if we want to understand these kind of complex real-world behaviors, we need to have at least some idea of what hot cognition is, how it, how it operates. Um, uh, just to make this a little bit more uh, intuitive, um, here is a personal example of hot cognition engaged in by none other than, than me uh, towards the, either towards the end of last year or, or the beginning of this year. Um, so I work at Monash University, so I'm out, all the way out here in the dark depths of the eastern suburbs. Many of you may not know about it, um, but uh, I, live, I live sort of over here in the, the northwest. 
And so when I want to get to and from, I spend a lot of money driving on tollways and et cetera. And I drive out here and I drive back. Um, and on one particular example, I was uh, on about this section of the freeway. I was coming back. Um, it was The traffic was quite bad. And a, uh, a tradie in a ute kind of cut me off. And I got really kind of incensed by this. I got really annoyed with the tradie. Uh, and I got so sort of, um, I uh, so much abandoned my cold cognition, my powers of reasoning, that I, I was, you know, uh, seething as I paid attention to this tradie that I missed my turn off and ended up driving uh, over the Westgate Bridge um, before I was able to get off and turn around and come back over the bridge. So this is, I would say, a personal example of hot cognition. Um, but it also sort of illustrates something that I think this simplistic dichotomy between hot and cognition, hot and cold cognition, um, actually kind of um, elides or, or hides some of the interesting things that are going on here. So there are a couple of different ways uh, that emotion and cognition can interact. Uh, and uh, the directions of those interactions are not always the, what we might think of based on that simple definition of hot cognition, where it's emotion affecting cognition. The links also come back the other way. And I'm trying to talk about both of these things in this talk today. Um, let me just, first of all, just define some terms. So what I'm talking about here uh, when I'm talking about emotion is all of the things that fall under the headings of subjective mood or affect or emotion. Um, I'm going to use these terms kind of interchangeably, though if I were presenting this work at an emotion conference, I'd be more careful about that because uh, lots of people at emotion conferences have big arguments about that. Um, I'm going to sort of be a little bit imprecise with these language and say it's the, you know, the felt component of subjective experience. And then, of course, over here in cognition, we have all of the things that many of the people in this room study, learning, decision-making, reasoning, attention, memory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what I want to point out is this example illustrates that there's a couple of different ways in which cognition and emotion might interact, and we can reasonably be interested in both of these. So number one is sort of maybe the classic idea of hot cognition. It's um, how are these cognitive processes that we're always uh, engaged in in our everyday lives, how are they influenced by the concurrent emotional states that we find ourselves in? So my, uh, my decision or my failure to attend to my exit on the freeway was in some way uh, influenced by my concurrent anger or, or um, annoyance or whatever you want to call that emotion when I was driving behind the tradie. Um, but what I want to point out is that that's not the only aspect of hot cognition that we might be interested in. Um, there's another one too, which is kind of this link back the other way. Um, and this is something that is emphasized more in kind of um, appraisal theories of emotion, which emphasize that emotions don't just appear in a vacuum. In some ways, emotional responses, uh, emotional reactions are reactions to a cognitive appraisal of something that's happened in the world. Um, so the way that I appraise that person's act of sort of cutting me off in traffic um, determines the emotional response that I have as a result. So if it hadn't been a tradie uh, in a ute, if it had been uh, an ambulance with its siren going, I would have formed a different cognitive appraisal of what might otherwise have been described as the same event and kind of had a different emotional reaction as a response. So what I want to emphasize is that we um, in kind of computational cognitive science do a lot of work to sort of develop formal models of cold cognition. And I think that a lot of that work in formal models can be extended usefully if we carefully ask uh, interesting questions to answer these sorts of questions as well. And what I'm going to try and do um, in this talk today is present two, uh, I'll try and get through two examples of that. Um, a quick defense of cold cognition because I, I, I don't want this to seem like a, like a diss track. Um, it's, I think it's the case that many important cognitive processes are best studied cold, are best studied kind of in the laboratory. So if we want to study an, um, uh, numerosity judgments, to, to give one example, it probably makes sense to understand how they work, you know, in the absence of an emotional state before we get to the question of, you know, how an emotional state might influence them. We may never get to that, that point because we may decide that's not an interesting question. Um, uh, many important real world behaviors, um, a lot of them involve hot cognition, but you can, you can say that a lot of them uh, do or should involve cold as well. So we have uh, over here, um, Steve Smith grabbing a catch in the slips. Uh, what he's doing there is some sort of um, complex cognitive appraisal of the trajectory of an object uh, made uh, in in very short amount of time so that he can get his body in the right position. That's probably too short a time frame for emotion to really be doing much there. That's, that's cold cognition in the, in the real world. Um, I served on a jury last year and it was quite interesting uh, as, as an experience. Uh, not least because one of the specific instructions that a, that a judge gives to the jury is you should disregard um, all inferences that are suggested to you by your feelings and only base your judgments on a, a cold and rational appraisal of the facts. So whether that's actually what goes on uh, in, in jury deliberations always is, is a separate question, but at least in principle how the system is supposed to work is involving only cold cognition. And the last point that I want to kind of really emphasize here as well is that a lot of the work that I'm going to present today sort of depends on there having been decades of work studying various kinds of decision making processes uh, in a cold form to build up a, a kind of a, a, um, a 
uh, consensus understanding of what's going on so that those models can then be sort of applied. And so in, if we want to understand how these things work in heart cognition, we actually, we can't go straight there. We need to build on the cold as well. Okay. So the specific questions that I'm going to be asking here today are trying to take the set of questions. There's a lot of different directions that you might take that program of research. I'm going to take it in one direction here, which is to ask about how the valence of a person's emotional states, that is the pleasantness or unpleasantness of their emotions, uh, interacts with risky decision making. Um, so people's willingness to take an action that has some unpredictable consequences. And from, from a methods perspective, the core idea that I'm going to um, work with here is just, it's a relatively uncontroversial idea, which is just that if we do want to understand how these um, cognitive processes and emotional processes are interacting with each other, as a first step, we might just want to measure them on the same time scale. So that's really the only methods advance um, here. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a standard decision-making task. It's going to be a prospect theoretic kind of risky gambles task. Um, and what we're just going to do is kind of have people iteratively do these gambles. And then every 20 or 30 seconds, we're just going to ask them for the subjective valence of their emotion. We're just going to ask them how they're feeling. And then what we're going to get um, is the ability to ask questions sort of about both of these reciprocal links here. Or I, I will claim that we'll get that. You can make up your own minds. Um, so this is mapping those broad questions that I mentioned in the previous slides onto some specific questions that I'll talk about today. So study one, uh, which I'll talk about first, is going to be about how does, um, given that we've measured somebody's emotional valence within this task, how predictive is that of the, the decisions that they make? How does that uh, affect their willingness to make risky decisions in particular? Given that we've measured both of those things at the same time, that's a, that's a question that we can ask. Uh, and then study two is going to be Within this task, people are going to be getting feedback on the consequences of their decisions all the time. You make a decision, you get feedback. You make a decision, you get feedback. And so uh, what's going to happen is that if we uh, have knowledge of the kind of feedback that they're getting, and we also have uh, self-reports of their emotional state, we can start to ask questions about how those self-reported emotional states are affected by the pieces of feedback that they're getting. So in theory, we can look at both arms of this kind of reciprocal interaction. Um, this is just... Um, different people understand different things by, by emotion. Um, this is just me stating what I am talking about here, not what you should, uh, what, not what you should believe. But basically, um, one core idea about emotion is that uh, the basic, at a basic level, we can understand it as operating in this um, uh, two-dimensional space where emotion moves from sort of unpleasant to pleasant on the valence axis and from deactivated to activated on the arousal axis. Um, so I just want to flag that what I'm going to be talking about here, I'm not going to talk about arousal at all, even though that's had quite a big part in the history of kind of some of this work, Schachter and Singer and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to be talking about people's movements along this valence axis, how sad to how happy do people feel. And then the other thing is that different fields disagree on what, on how emotion is best measured. Um, so I've given this talk occasionally to people who do um, marketing or um, uh, economics or something like that. And there it's, it's kind of, it's almost a dogma that the way you measure emotion is with skin conductance responses, because you wouldn't want to use somebody's subjective self-report because people aren't incentivized to give it accurately and people aren't, you know, and that's not the, the relevant thing for behavior and, and so on. I kind of disagree with that. Um, I'm interested in that subjectively experienced component. I'm not saying it's the only component of emotion that we might reasonably be interested in, but when I am talking about emotion in this study, I'm talking about fluctuations along this axis as people subjectively introspect about them. And here's the task that I'm going to be using uh, in both of these experiments. It's a... Uh, uh, a fairly simple one, but it's uh, it's sort of the workhorse for a lot of this work. And so I'll just take a minute to just explain it to make sure everyone's on the same page. So what uh, people are doing on every trial of this task is choosing between these two card stimuli. And on the uh, on the back of each card, we have information about the things that they might find on the other side. So what we have here is on the left, uh, a card with a 50% chance of, ha of having a 100-point win on the other side and a 50% chance of having a 100-point loss on the other side. So if it turns over and there's a blue uh, color, that means they've won 100 points. If it turns over and there's a green color, that means they've lost 100 points. The size of these bars is just indica uh, uh, indicating the probability. So this is a 50-50 gamble. And then they're choosing between that and a gamble uh, that has a probability 75% uh, of winning zero points and a probability of 25% of winning 100 points. So this is a fairly standard um, prospect theoretic uh, risky decision-making task. We've, uh, uh, we're making people play for points rather than kind of real monetary amounts, but otherwise, other than that, it's uh, fairly standard. So people here uh, make their choice. So here the person has chosen the one on the left 
And uh, in some versions of this task, we, we turn over both cards. In some versions of this task, we only turn over one card. Uh, that distinction actually isn't going to matter too much for the purposes of this talk today, but I, I, it's something I think about a little bit, so I can, I'm happy to chat more. Um, but basically what happens here is this person has lost 100 points, um, and then we immediately ask them to self-report their emotional state. And so if they care about what's going on in the task, um, which they don't have to, but if they do care about what's going on in the task, then this self-report of their emotional state might be a little bit more negative than it was previously. Um, here are um, just some, uh, some broad details of the study, which I won't dwell too much on. Um, people play for about half an hour. Uh, they trade these points for a small monetary bonus at the end of the task. So the monetary bonus is small. It's between uh, zero and US zero and one US dollar. Uh, it's another reason for having points is that if we put the actual monetary amounts here, it'd be you know gain two cents versus lose two cents, and I feel like this is more uh, uh, likely to kind of incentivize engagement. Um, so what we have is uh, 212 choice trials. And then across the whole course of the, the study, which runs for about 25 minutes or half an hour, we have 56 of these mood valence self-reports. They come up every three to five trials. Uh, what we specifically instruct people is that the left extreme is as unhappy as you can imagine feeling. The right extreme is as happy as you can imagine feeling. Um, and then what we end up with is, uh, well, first of all, we end up with the choice data. We, we see what, what gamble participants choose in every single trial, what feedback they get. Uh, but on the emotion side of things, what we get are these uh, time series of emotion self-reports. So here are the different mood reports from one to about 56. And here is uh, the self-reports of one example participant. So this participant here started out feeling good. Uh, the mood immediately declined because they realized they were doing a boring cognitive task. <laughs> and then it kind of it fluctuates around whatever level it declines to uh, for the remainder of the experiment. So... These two research questions that I talked about, the two arms of this reciprocal link, can basically be thought of kind of with respect to a graph like this one. When we're asking how this emotional state influences decision making, we're saying at each point in time, right after these measurements, people make a decision. And we know what emotional state they say they're in uh, at the time of making the decision. And we can start to say, is, there, is the variance in this, in this time series here, uh, is that related to variance in their choices? Um, and specifically in their willingness to, to choose risky options. Uh, that would be our link between emotion and cognition. In order to look at the links between cognition and emotion, we can just kind of reverse the arrows. So we can say, at this point here, the person experienced this kind of feedback, and here they experienced this kind of feedback, et cetera, et cetera. And we can start to work out what are the relevant dimensions of the feedback that they are um, observing for explaining variance in this time series. There doesn't have to be any. A person may just you know, be responding at random because they don't care about anything that's happening in the task. And in that case, we should uh, give ourselves a model that can kind of pull out that lack of an effect as well. Okay, so what I'll talk about is the first of these links first and the second uh, second. I realize I don't have a clock or anything like that. Um, I should probably uh, keep track of things, but I just want to make sure I'm keeping track of time. 11. 11, great, thanks. Okay, um, I'll try and talk for about another 20 or 25 minutes. Okay. So what I'm asking here is how an individual's emotional valence as measured through these subjective self-reports is uh, related to their willingness to make risky decisions in a task like this one. Um, there are, this is not the first time that this question has been asked. There is a whole large literature on this. Here's one example of this. Um, this is uh, some work by Ross Otto and colleagues uh, in 2016. So it turns out that, uh, uh, that the purchase of um, lottery tickets in New York City uh, tends to go up when a citywide proxy for mood goes up. So there's a lot of kind of computational work here, but basically we're going to come back to the citywide proxy of, uh, for mood. But basically when people are pleasantly surprised either by the performance of New York sporting teams uh, or by uh, getting, uh, they measure the solar irradiance, so how much sun there is relative to usual in New York. Um, they measure the sort of the, the prediction error for all of these things. And it turns out that when the prediction error is positive for sport or for solar irradiance, people purchase more lottery tickets. This is one kind of cute example of this. Uh, this is one reason why we might think that you know, um, self-reported emotional valence might be associated with risk preferences is because we, we potentially see it depending on how you interpret these data in these macro scale economic decisions. Um, but the literature on this question is really large, really messy. Um, uh, by my count, there's at least 25 papers on this topic and the results are, and I want to emphasize this, completely incoherent and inconsistent with one another. So for every paper showing that positive emotion produces increased risk seeking, there's a paper showing that positive emotion produces increased risk aversion. Um, there doesn't seem to be any systematic relationship with the kinds of uh, paradigms that people are using. 
I have some thoughts about why this might be, um, but I uh, just want to say this is why I think it's interesting to go after this approach, uh, which people haven't done before, is because there's a lot of contradictory evidence out there in the literature. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to take advantage of uh, data that was actually collected for a separate experiment that I'm not talking about today, but we have two separate experiments where we, people do this task uh, programmed up in JavaScript. So we have 320 people in experiment one, 509 people in experiment two. Um, they're all doing this task. Um, here, for instance, just to give you a feel for the sort of the variance in the data, here are six randomly chosen participants and their time series of motion throughout the task. So there is there does seem to be some sort of, uh, there are some people who self-report being at the same emotion level the entire time, but there, for every one of those, there's many more people like this who do seem to give us some sort of variance in their subjective emotional state as they do the task. And again, what we're asking here is how that variance relates to these uh, risky choices. So um, before we get to the modeling, um, I'll say we supported uh, basically the opposite finding of that uh, citywide lottery ticket finding. What we find is a small but replicable, replicable effect where uh, in both experiments, more positive affect, that is uh, more pleasant emotional states are associated with uh, decreased rates of choosing the risky gambles. So that's what's plotted on the y-axis here. And there, here we have the raw emotional valence with no pre-processing done, uh, just saying, you know, these are all the self-reports where people were very sad. These are all the self-reports where people were very happy. Of course, you may immediately see that that's not the most satisfying way of analyzing these data because there's some kind of, there's some deep uh, statistical ambiguities about what might be driving the effects that we see here. Um, so for that, what we're going to turn to is modeling of the data um, uh, using, uh, I've got this up for reference, but basically using a standard model of this task, which is kind of a prospect theoretic model uh, of risky decision making. And what we're going to try and do is get around this statistical ambiguity that I mentioned, which I'll unpack a bit. So here's the same finding that I mentioned already. We, we find more positive affect leading to decreased rates of choosing the risky gambles in both experiments. I say this is kind of statistically or psychologically ambiguous because there's at least two places uh, or at least um, two sources of variance that might be producing this effect overall. Uh, the first is kind of a between participants explanation. So it may be the case that the participants who tend to report worse overall mood are the same people who are more likely to take risks overall. And the people who are, tend to be happier overall are the kind of people who tend to take fewer risks overall. That would explain the data that we're seeing. That would be something like this if these are two uh, uh, participants doing this task, we would say, you know, this person is less risk taking in general uh, because they are happier. This person is more risk taking in general because they are sadder. Um, there's also a within participants explanation, which is maybe it's not the between participants variance that matters. Maybe what matters is people's own movements relative to their, their own baseline. Um, so maybe it's the case that uh, each individual person becomes more risk seeking as they move, as they get sadder than their own uh, baseline, and each individual person becomes more uh, risk averse as they become a little happier than their own baseline. So that would be the case that if that's the case, what we would expect is that in a time series like this one, a person becomes less uh, less risk seeking up here when they're a bit happier and more risk taking down here when they're a bit sadder. Uh, I'll move relatively quickly over this, but this is just to say that we can basically um, dissociate these two things by um, dissecting the overall uh, variance in the data into a kind of participant mean component and a variance component. So basically what we can do is say each of these two people has some mean level um, and there's going to be systematic variance across the sample in that. And then relative to that mean level, there's also going to be some fluctuations. And we can ask whether the variance that we're seeing uh, in people's risk-taking behavior, is it related to where the red line is or is it related to the size of the blue arrow relative to the red line? Uh, and what we're basically going to do is, I'll move, yeah, I'll move relatively quickly over this. What we're basically going to do is um, uh, use hierarchical Bayesian modeling of our data here, where basically we fit, first of all, I'll go back, we fit a standard prospect theory model. Um, this is a, a out of the box standard model for this task uh, that has a number of different parameters controlling things like uh, the degree of curvature of the utility function in the gain domain that's kind of controlling risk aversion and the, the steepness in the loss domain that's kind of controlling loss aversion. And then we can say for each of these three parameters, uh, compare a set of models that allow each of these parameters to vary by uh, either the between participants variance in emotion or the within participants variance in emotion. Uh, that's what I'm trying to express here, but there's probably more um, equations than is useful. Um, I'll tell you the results of this model comparison, which is that when you allow the parameters of the model to vary according to the emotional state, uh, both between and within people, what you find is that 
the model parameter that's being influenced by these emotional fluctuations seems to be the degree of risk aversion for prospective gains. So um, remember, there were the different uh, gambles that people were taking where some of them had like uh, plus 100, there were plus 200 options in there as well. So the degree to which there's decreasing marginal utility uh, for those prospective gains seems to be what's co-varying uh, with between within person emotion here. And this is what those effects look like. So um, what I'm plotting here is uh, uh, the, the central line here is the, the group level median. Uh, and on the left is between participant differences, on the right is within participant variances. So the way to read this is that, um, and these uh, here, the light blue line is these are people whose average mood is one standard deviation worse than the population average. These are people whose, uh, the darker line, people whose average mood is one standard deviation better than the population average. Um, so we'll talk about this one first of all. What we find here is that there are these sort of systematic between person differences such that uh, people who are, uh, sadder at an average level tend to be more risk seeking in this task on an average level and the uh, the slope of these sort of these curves here give you an idea of the magnitude of that effect but we also find evidence for within person differences so we see that there are not only these um, differences in terms of people's average mood level but individual people's variance relative to their own baseline also seems to matter so uh, the effect size of this is roughly half the effect size of the between person differences but it's still significant across both um, uh, across both data sets. Basically here, minus one standard deviation is when a person is one standard deviation sad of an average for themselves. And uh, plus one standard deviation is when a person is one standard deviation happier than average for themselves. We see the same sorts of effects overall. Okay, so let me just summarize those results briefly. So we found this effect whereby self-reported mood valence was negatively associated with risk tolerance, such that people who are happier, more positive emotion was associated with less risk taking, more negative emotion was associated with more risk taking. And what we seem to see is that the effect is driven by both between person variance and within person variance. Um, so uh, it's a combination of those two things, the two hypotheses that I mentioned. These two hypotheses, by the way, have not really been canvassed in a lot of detail in the previous work on this literature. And that's, I think, one reason why uh, um, there's sort of some heterogeneity across studies. Although, as, as I've said here, like the, the two effects are going in the same direction here. So it doesn't completely explain that kind of uh, lack of coherence. What does this mean conceptually? Like, what does this tell us about hot cognition? Um, well, one possibility that I like, and this is kind of speculative interpretation now, um, is that the standard way of thinking about people's behavior in a, a prospect theory gambling sense is that people have some sorts of preferences over the outcomes of gambles. I want to win points, I don't want to lose points, something along those lines. You can explain these data as well a little bit if you assume that people don't just have preferences over the number of points they win, but they have preferences over the emotional states that will result from, uh, from winning or losing those points. So I, this is a simple and pat way of saying it, that I prefer to feel good, I do not prefer to feel bad. And that's gonna be correlated with the number of points, but it's gonna be distinct in some interesting ways. Um, it suggests that uh, when I make these decisions, maybe I anticipate the emotional response uh, that I'm going to have and optimize over that as well as or uh, in addition to uh, the number of points that I win. So why would this kind of explain the results we're seeing? It's kind of because these anticipated emotional changes in general have to be nonlinear. Um, and the reason for that is that if you're up here and you are already feeling, you know, as good as is you are likely to feel, in general, it's not likely that winning a few more points is going to make you feel a whole lot happier, but losing points may, might make you feel a whole lot sadder. You sort of see that, this is a cherry picked example, but you sort of see that in this person where they, you know, the positive fluctuations are not that large, but then there are there is room for a lot of negative fluctuation. And so because of that potential nonlinearity, when you're feeling sad, there's a lot of room for mood improvement, which might lead people to sort of chase gains uh, because of that potential uh, room for mood improvement. On the other hand, when you're feeling happy, you know, if you don't reasonably foresee any more improvement in mood for yourself doing this task, you don't really have any reason uh, to go after the risky gains anymore. And so that's what we're seeing in those prospect theory results is that it's really the large gains uh, that are being kind of sort of decremented in utility uh, when people are in their happier moods. So I think this suggests sort of an interesting framework um, uh, that needs to be sort of fleshed out much more, but um, an idea that people might be optimizing over their own anticipated emotional states. Um, in a way that we can use the mechanics of a model like prospect theory to try and get at this. But of course, there's, there's some deep uh, philosophical difficulties there about, you know, how, how can people know, you know, the way they're going to feel? They can only sort of anticipate the way that they're going to feel. And so we're optimizing over beliefs about emotions in addition to uh, actual outcomes. And, and the, 
the, the tractability of those models starts to get a little hairy. Um, so I think, I think there's reason to sort of keep pulling on this thread, but I just want to flag that it's, there are some thorny conceptual things that will need to be sort of ironed out here as well. Okay, I want to move on to study two as well. So this is asking about that, uh, that reciprocal link. It's about um, how do the cognitive appraisals kind of determine the emotional reactions? Um, Paul, can I do a quick time check? Yeah, 11.33. Uh, 11.33, great, thank you. Okay, um, so here we're looking at this direction. So here we're saying people, last time we were looking at sort of the effect of this emotional variance on people's choices. Here we're saying that there are these outcomes on every single trial of the task. And we wanna know what it is about these outcomes that's driving people's um, uh, emotional valence here. Why, why do people feel the way they do as they do this task? Um, I wanna come back to this study here um, because I sort of skated over this, but I said lottery tickets are purchased more when citywide mood improves. How did they? How do you know that citywide mood improves? Turns out they didn't measure citywide mood here. What they were doing was measuring this proxy for citywide mood, which is sort of a, a moving average of the number of prediction errors that have happened recently. So uh, let's say down here, when there's been a bunch of unexpected wins by the sports teams, they're saying that the citywide mood is going to improve there um, under the implicit assumption that what mood is, is kind of a moving average of reward prediction errors. So these results are premised on a particular theoretical interpretation of mood. And that's what I want to interrogate in this particular project here. Um, this proposition doesn't come out of nowhere. This idea that uh, mood or emotion on that kind of longer time scale, uh, the idea that it's best modeled as kind of an integral of reward prediction errors has been really influential in recent years. Uh, in particular, a lot of work by Rob Rutledge, uh, Iran Eldar as well. Um, just to unpack this a little bit, because a reward prediction error is basically a measure of whether a particular event has exceeded my expectations or not. So if an event has been better than expected, that's a positive reward prediction error. If an event has been worse than expected, that's a negative reward prediction error. And so a sequence of positive reward prediction errors would mean things are repeatedly going better than expected. A, a series of uh, negative reward prediction errors would be things are repeatedly going worse than expected. And so the theoretical claim that what mood is, uh, is an integral of these reward prediction errors basically amounts to saying that the only thing that matters uh, for my long-term emotional state is uh, how well things have been going relative to my expectations. Um, turns out that that proposal, although it's, um, it's gained a lot of traction, has not really been uh, uh, examined in a lot of detail. Uh, and this is just illustrating that, has not really been examined in a lot of detail. It's sort of been asserted by fiat um, in a lot of this literature that what mood is, is this, because it's theoretically nice to think that that's what it might be. It has some nice sort of uh, mean correcting properties. Uh, it means that different people can have different set points and, and things like that, but it does, hasn't actually been uh, explicitly uh, tested a great deal. So what I wanna do in this project is to go back to the kind of one of these core assumptions of this particular field of modeling and see whether it holds up. So um, to illustrate this, what I wanna say is that we need to offer sort of an alternative hypothesis as well. If, if, if mood isn't just a running average of, of reward prediction errors, what are some other things that it might be? To illustrate this, here's a couple of toy examples of what a reward prediction er error is in a task like the one that I'm presenting here. Uh, so let's just imagine for a second that you choose this stimulus here. So you've chosen a stimulus that has a 50% chance of paying out a reward of zero points, that is a status quo reward, and a 50% chance of losing 100 points. Uh, you might have chosen this stimulus because the other stimulus was even worse. So imagine as an outcome of that stimulus uh, that you win zero points. The reward prediction error of that is going to be, uh, it's defined as the outcome here minus your mathematical expectation here. So the mathematical expectation here is just a loss of 50 points. And so this particular outcome has a reward prediction error of plus 50. On the other hand, you can imagine the exact same outcome happening after you choose uh, this card here, where the zero uh, point win is the worst of the two possible options. And here, the exact same outcome is going to have a reward prediction error of minus 50. So same outcome. Uh, on the top, it beats expectations. On the, on the bottom, it's worse than expectations. And so what I'm really going to do here is trying to kind of systematically ask the question, if, uh, if mood is best understood as a kind of moving average of reward prediction errors, then we should see different sorts of effects on these kinds of trials. But the alternative is, is that maybe, maybe this is uh, kind of theoretically too nice. Maybe this is kind of sort of an assumption that isn't tenable. Maybe the only thing that matters is the outcome. Maybe the, the emotional response to these two things is going to be exactly the same, contrary to what a lot of people have assumed in this literature. Um, worth saying here that these are hard. One of the reasons why people haven't really looked a lot into this is because by design, 
these two things are kind of really highly correlated with each other. It will tend to be the case that uh, large rewards tend to produce positive reward prediction errors and large losses tend to produce negative reward prediction errors. Here's what these data, uh, if we plot the reward prediction error size against the, um, the kind of, this is the outcome amount, the gain or loss amount uh, in the task like the one I've been presenting, it looks kind of like this. So they're correlated really strongly with each other. Um, this makes it doubly hard um, to interpret those results of previous studies which have just analyzed reward prediction errors because you can see here that if you if you use this as a predictor of people's emotions when they're really being driven by this you would do a reasonably good job because they're correlated at, at about 0.84 um, but the interesting thing here is if we just sort of look within a particular level and we look at positive versus negative reward prediction errors what do we see um, uh, this is just some details of participant recruitment in this task uh, so here we have 150 adults uh, doing this task via prolific. Um, it's relatively, it's a little bit peripheral for the um, for the, the overall framing that I've given you here today. Um, we had uh, a forced choice condition in this task as well. We were wanting to look at the effects of um, the agency you have over your choice on the kind of the processing of these different things. I'm flagging it here because it turns out to matter for the results, um, but it's not kind of a core um, theoretical aspect of this. Basically, these are the only differences uh, here, just to flag, we're not providing that kind of counterfactual feedback. Again, happy to talk about that later. But basically we're working with pretty much exactly the same task. And we're just asking a question about how these outcomes here are driving these uh, fluctuations in subjective emotional valence. Uh, we can plot this in a few different ways. So what I'm plotting here on the y-axis uh, in the first two graphs uh, is change in emotional valence. So change relative to the last time you were asked. So if I ask you on trial two, how are you feeling? And you tell me you're you know, a six out of 10 and I ask you again five trials later and you say I'm now a seven out of 10, then the change is plus one. Uh, I'm expressing this in sort of the percentage of the length of the slider here. Uh, what we can basically do just as kind of a, first of all, a sanity check to make sure that our task is uh, actually inducing emotional kind of variance is to plot the amount of emotional change uh, as a function of whether people are losing money over here or gaining money over here. And this sort of looks more or less like we would like it to. So people get happier when they win, they get sadder when they lose. This is a nice sanity check. Um, what we can do next is ask about reward prediction errors. So we get one of these on every trial. The reason we get one on every trial is because all of the options are kind of probabilistic. And so on every trial, there's some deviation from expectations in the, in the outcome. When we do a similar plot there, we appear to get this conclusion whereby, oh, it looks like both, uh, both outcome uh, reward amount on the left and reward prediction error in the middle it looks like they're both driving uh, emotional responses to some degree but of course I showed you on the previous slide that these are quite highly correlated with one another so what we can do is we can sort of start to say and this is a theoretical judgment now to me the outcome seems more basic seems more sort of psychologically primitive uh, one reason I say that is because you need to have the outcome already in order to even calculate the reward prediction error so this feels like a secondary appraisal um, this is a discussion I'm having with reviewers on this paper at the moment, so I just wanted to flag that. But what you can do uh, is you can do this regression, look at the variance that remains, and then see to what extent um, you, uh, that's explained by the reward prediction error. So if we control for the gain loss amount uh, and we look at the effects of the reward prediction error on mood, and remember this is the variable that's assumed to be the primary variable driving mood in a lot of theoretical models, we basically don't see anything all that impressive. We do still see a, a statistically significant effect here, um, but the magnitude of, of the effect is maybe about 15 or 20% of the size it is if you didn't control for the reward amount as well. Uh, because this uh, is a talk about cool models of hot cognition, I need to have a model in here as well, but it's basically gonna try and sort of recapitulate and give a bit more nuance on this question. So we're gonna have a model for emotion self-reports, which is just gonna be in this particular case, um, we have a slider, the slider is bounded between zero and one. So we're gonna have a beta distributed variable. Uh, and we're gonna assume that the beta distributed variable uh, at any point in time reflects some uh, average uh, mood level per participant. That's this W zero parameter, plus sort of a, a decaying sum of the uh, experiences that they've had on the previous trials, which is the different uh, appraisals that they might make. And then we're gonna compare different models based on different combinations of these appraisals. So we're gonna say, you know, how well do we do if we assume that there are, you know, people are just exp explained by a baseline level, that's gonna be model zero. Uh, and then we can add sort of different things that you can compute from the feedback as predictors of the, uh, of the outcome. Uh, you can do things like, you know, just comparing gain and loss amount to reward prediction error amount. You can have both of them in there at the same time. And the other aspect that you'll notice here is there's uh, asymmetry in appraisal weighting. 
what that means is whether positive and negative appraisals are allowed to have different effects. So if there's asymmetry, then a gain might have a different effect to a loss. A positive reward prediction error might have a different effect to a negative reward prediction error. Um, and when we uh, do, I won't walk you through all the, all the tables in the model comparison. Um, there's a preprint that I can refer people to if they're interested. But basically when we do this model, what we find is that the best fitting model uh, is to assume that people's emotions are driven by two things. One is the gain or loss amount, that is the actual outcome amount on every trial. And the second one is the reward prediction error. And we're allowing for some asymmetry between positive and negative here. The really interesting thing here comes when we kind of um, go into the entrails of this model and expect, inspect the parameter estimates um, and allow them to vary across conditions in an interesting way, because what we get is uh, plots like this one that allow us to quantify the degree of change in subjective affect per 100 points for each of these different outcome types. So what we have up here is, you know, gain outcomes on free choice trials. So these are when you win after freely choosing something, gain outcomes on forced choice trials, loss outcomes, et cetera. What you see here is that we get this nice, uh, I, if I'd been presenting this on a Mac, there would have been some nice histograms here as well. But basically assume that there are pretty histograms on, on top of these. Um, these are basically estimates of the effect of each of these different outcome types on subjective affect. So what we see is that gain outcomes, uh, affect consistently becomes more pleasant, sort of more or less regardless of whether it's a free choice or a forced choice. In loss outcomes, we, um, we see uh, affect consistently becoming a little bit worse. The interesting thing here is when we look at this uh, reward prediction error appraisal, the one that again has been assumed to be fundamental in a lot of the models in this field, what we see is that the only condition type for which we see a significant effect of reward prediction errors on mood is negative reward prediction errors on free choice trials. And this is going to be sort of, the, these are coming from the same model. So this effect is sort of going to be kind of above and beyond the effect here. But this is saying that quite contrary to the idea that we should model reward prediction errors as the kind of the fundamental appraisal that drives mood, that this is what mood is. Actually, when you are a little bit more careful in the way you sort of put regressors in the model, you only see uh, effects of things that are worse than average. You see quite a small effect. Uh, and you only see that effect if people choose freely, not if the uh, choice, choice is made for them. So that sort of points away from this idea that this is kind of a, a fundamental appraisal that is driving emotion. Um, basically, you know, th this, this challenge is one of the kind of one of the most influential assumptions in this field. Um, it suggests that a lot of the existing theories of mood, computational theories of mood, that is, need to be revised, including, I should say, some that I have proposed before I started testing this uh, particular assumption, and suggests that when we have data like these ones from this citywide modeling study, it may well be the case that variance in these prediction errors is associated with variance in lottery behavior, but the assumption that mood is the sort of the citywide mediating variable that explains that is potentially not, uh, potentially not tenable or potentially needs to be revisited in some way. Okay, I'll try and wrap up briefly here. Um, what I've tried to do here is talk about these two aspects of, of hot cognition and try and talk about some of the ways in which the techniques, the tools that we use in computational cognitive science can be sort of fruitfully extended to this domain of emotion where they haven't necessarily been used a great deal in the past. So we've been talking here about how variance in this emotion self-report influences the decisions that are made. We've been talking about how the outcomes of those decisions in themselves feedback influence emotion. Um, as an aside, I haven't talked about it at all here, but anytime you have sort of this bi-directional link, which I believe I have on the next slide, um, you have the potential for interesting sorts of feedback loops to be set up. So uh, if uh, a particular emotional state caused a particular change in decision making that led to a particular kind of feedback to be delivered, you can imagine how people might get themselves into a state where, uh, um, as a result of these sort of dysfunctional positive interactions, um, you can potentially explain mood escalation in things like bipolar disorder, uh, mood deterioration and things like depression at a sort of conceptual level. You know, you can simulate these models and they do interesting things. Whether it actually explains the phenomenology is, is another question. Um, so I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank, uh, in particular, Ashley Forbes and Laura, uh, Ashley Fulton and Laura Forbes, uh, who were two honours uh, students who worked on this project. Um, uh, thank funding sources. Uh, these studies are both currently under review. There's a preprint link for study two here if anyone's interested. Uh, I actually only presented one of the two experiments. It's in the, that paper. There's some other interesting things going on as well. Um, and I actually want to end with a plug, um, just in case anyone here in this crowd is interested. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, um, I'm organising a gambling research symposium uh, at Monash University. Um, this is going to be sort of the applied angle of a lot of this work. 
I mentioned that gambling is an area I'm really interested in. Um, you know, thinking about hot cognition in the wild, some of the potential harms that might result. This is one area where that might happen. So if anyone, if this is of, is of interest to anyone, I wanted to leave this up here um, and just say, um, uh, we'll have in-person attendance, but also Zoom attendance if anyone just wants to grab a free ticket and come along. Okay, great. I'll put it back. And yeah, thank you all for your time. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question about the first study, and I'm not quite sure what your yep. interpretation of this is. So, when the mood goes down, you take more risks, right? That that's right. So it, it just feels super counterintuitive in the way that when your mood is already down and you want to get it up, you're doing something that actually has a higher risk of getting it more down. Yeah. So. And then on the other hand, there was this, usually probably the mood is down because they kept losing, right? Mm. So the experience is also, you lose. Mm. So what is, what's happening? What do, do you think like the risk perception changes that people at some stage should switch or, or is it so important to get out of this that, yeah, that you I, don't care anymore? It's, it's a really interesting question. I, first thing to say is like, I, we, we get a little bit of a handle on this by looking at which parameters of the model are modulated, I think. But in terms of what it feels like for participants, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. But um, I'll, I'll offer something here. So I, I talked mostly about sort of this, this part of the graph here. And I said things are changing in terms of degree of risk aversion for gains. Um, what I didn't say is that, you know, we had other parameters in this model that were also allowed to vary. Uh, things like degree of curvature of the utility function for losses, degree of loss aversion, and we don't see any effect of these emotional states there. Which that's that you know that model comparison result is why I'm talking mostly about gains here. Um, and the other thing to say is I, I think I think it's possible that this I think this nonlinearity starts to matter. So I think if if our emotional Imagine we were different sorts of organisms and we had uh, emotional states that sort of could sort of increase unboundedly or, or decrease unboundedly. And, you know, I, I could always get, get happier no matter happy, how happy I was and I could always get sad no matter how sad I was. Um, then, then I agree, you couldn't, you couldn't explain things in this way. But I think, it's, I think it comes from the nonlinearity that um, if in this scenario you describe where people have had a bunch of losses, they're feeling pretty crappy, they anticipate that they're not going to feel even more crappy if they have another loss but they anticipate that they will feel a lot better if they have a win. And so it's, it's, not, lo it's not necessarily nonlinearity that comes sort of endogenously. It's, like it's not necessarily nonlinearity that comes from the person's cognition. I think it's, it's nonlinearity that comes from the fact that when you move up here, you know, your headroom for getting better is sort of compressed. And when you move down here, you know, the, the, the floor is closer and the amount, of, the amount that you can go down is sort of compressed. It's also, I should say, potentially an artifact of the sorts of... Um, um, uh, the sorts of decisions we're asking people to make in a task like this one. So if if you think of the sorts of risky decisions that a person might make in the real world, um, a lot of them have the potential for, you know, he, here the risk that they run is, you know, they lose 200 points, which is equivalent to, you know, a loss of four cents or, or something like that. But if uh, the example is, let's say, um, uh, driving without a seatbelt or, or something like that, then there the losses are not on that small scale, they're much larger. And so potentially the prospect of those much larger losses could lead to some different kinds of dynamics in the real world. But at least when we have this very sort of controlled setup and we know exactly what sort of outcomes people might be anticipating, we do seem to see that most of the action is in the appraisal of, uh, of prospective gains. Oh, um... I kind of had a related question, but yeah. I think you've already answered it. Um, but yeah, kind of going along with that, it just, it seems as if in real world settings when people are depressed or sad, that I, I wouldn't describe the, the behavior as kind of generally risk-taking yeah. type behavior. Yeah. And so, yeah, it does, I was wondering if you could maybe just, I, I think you've already commented on that, but it, it seems like this might be specific to the task or even the model, yeah. that interpretation. I, I think that's probably right. I think that... A lot of these, a lot of these interpretations come from knowing that people are making, you know, choices from a particular suite that we understand well. Whereas, you know, if if people are in the real world, there's any number of things that they might be doing at any point in time. 
and the, even the choice of you know the decision set that that people have the things that they sort of are consciously deciding between here we control it in the real world we don't control it at all um and i i suspect this is sort of answering a slightly different question to the one you answered but i suspect this might also be a reason why we see so much heterogeneity in the sorts of um, effects that we see because people assess risk in lots of really different ways as well and some of the measures of risk in those uh, studies that i mentioned are sort of self-report survey measures about people's willingness to engage in these sorts of real world behaviors um so um the dospert is a classic questionnaire um it, you know it might say you know how likely are you to um Go down a ski run that's beyond your ability or something like that and so there it, it does feel like uh we're talking about a qualitatively different regime i think so i think there's some advantages of sort of you know taking the 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 tools of cold cognition and sort of adding you know adding heat to them um but there's there's some extent to which like it, it's still sort of a bridge too far to say we have a model of kind of complex behavior in the real world because it has all of these complex properties that just aren't features of a task like this one um all the more so for something like depression as well um if, if i could just add a point onto that what if like i i'm, I'm generally unfamiliar with these the, the literature on this task but have any people have, has anybody looked at variants where you have the option to just stop playing or just withdraw entirely that's a an interesting question um the literature on this is so so large that I I bet I bet that's been looked at, but it's not something that I'm that I'm familiar with. Um, the it would be an interesting question to look at that. The difficulty is, you know, recruiting by a prolific. If you give people the uh, the option to stop playing, uh, stop paying, stop playing, and immediately get paid for their performance, people are just going to sort of do that because they want to spend five minutes on your task instead of thirty, which is which is asking a question again that you that you didn't answer. But I. I don't know what would what do you think you would see well I, so I guess it would depend on whether there was payment involved or if there was another task they'd have yeah, yeah after yeah, that yeah. or something yeah. there's there, I think there's various ways you could implement it but it, it just seems as if when their mood gets negative enough they would just withdraw entirely and and that's and yeah okay um that's a really important point I think is that you know we are we are forcing them to you know we, we only analyze data from people who do the, the entire task and presumably there's some you know we recruited 800 people presumably there's some small proportion of people who rage quit at some point during during the task right and we don't we you know that sense of data and we don't we don't have access to it um but the even the idea of approach and withdrawal um as being decisions that are sort of affected by emotion I think could be a, a useful way to start to start taking this because it's to go back to your previous question one feature of um cognition and behavior in in depression in particular is is a withdrawal kind of response it's why things like behavioral activation therapy just getting people to schedule activities turns out to be quite a useful therapy is because it, it gets people to engage in things that get, deliver them some degree of reinforcement from from the world and so that's sort of again one of those aspects of behavior in the real world that is just it's just not captured here um, but I feel like looking at approach and withdrawal as influenced by sort of a, a, a manipulation like this one could be could be a reasonable way forward. Thanks. Another one, if I may. Um, one other thing about this is that it, it looks like the, the decrease in mood is related to what you lose, right? So yeah. uh, what do you think? Could you decouple this? Could Could you give like have people lose smaller amounts but give them really negative feedback like a really bad sound that indicates losing and then see if it's actually the mood or is it because like the alternative might be you know if I if I lose a lot and I come to the point where I really need the points mm. and take more risk and it's mm. actually not the mood but it's just like where I am with my point balance that's yeah that's a good point I my, my thought immediately goes to and you you know this work because I think I believe you're, you're supervising the student but uh, Dan Miles stuff on like losses disguised as wins in um, in uh, electronic gaming machines and how even if you're losing money in those if they play you a sound that indicates you that something good has happened then people have a positive emotional response and they and they keep playing yeah so, you could you could turn it around to do it yeah I, I I think I think the end the logical end point of this is just you know developing an electronic gaming machine that we we get people to do on prolific and measure their emotions and see what see what happens I hadn't thought about it for the lost domain though I, I'd have to think you know, like, yeah just uh, playing like a bow sound or something I do have one one additional thing um so over in the field lab who do emotions color green Austin green away and in Cobal um they have a a new database that they've made called the emote database that has 27 data sets from mm. um real world yeah. collection um 
it seems like this will be a great testing ground. Um, Pete Covell and, and I have had, have had some of those chats, those like chats. In, initial chats, yeah, because there, there's a, okay, just, just to um, broaden out, so, you know, uh, a lot of people in the field of emotion research are working with ecological momentary assessment. So you get emotion time series, not over the course of 25 minutes, like in a task like this one, but you get them over, you know, 25 days or, or something like that. And so one intriguing possibility is whether the dynamic, one intriguing question, I think, is whether the dyna dynamics that we see in a task like this one that we model here, whether they are qualitatively the same as the dynamics that emerge sort of over, over hours and days, or whether there's something different that's happening at this shorter time scale. Um, yeah, uh, Pete Covell and I have been talking about ways to potentially get this off the ground. It's interesting because uh, the reason I click forward to this one here is it's not at all evident from this particular way of writing it out, but you can rearrange this equation so that it basically is an AR1 model of the kind that they use to model their motion time series. So yeah, we, we think that it might be a fruitful uh, sort of way of doing things. And the other thing that sprang to mind when I was looking at this is stuff that Simon usually will talk about, which is converging cross mapping. Uh, <laughs> um, which is but, not something I you know. Uh, so it's a dynamic causal modeling uh -huh. uh, method. Um, but just looking at the time series for things like Pierre Cavell's stuff, which is long time series, yep. it's, it's very hard to do that because you know getting the necessary causal relationship over those times is quite yep. difficult. But this seems like it could be in the vein of the possibility yep. um, to see if what's causal in which direction. But we can talk about that. Yeah, uh, uh, I can. I can say this because I, I feel like I'm within friends here. What you're describing is uh, study three of a Decker application I put in that didn't get up. That would have uh, that would have brought me here to work with Pete. So blame the ARC. <laughs> um, and unless there are more questions, we might have to end it there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you all very much for your time.